Okay, I think we're ready to go. Uh, my name is Jack Young and I am a project manager at Syria. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar to launch Syria's new guidance on INSAR and Earth observation techniques for infrastructure. Uh, it's a great turnout today. We, we do have around 70 people registered, so thank you to those that are able to make it this morning on a, on a Friday. Uh, but before we do begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping points. Um, great, slides a little slow. Okay, uh, so today's webinar is being recorded. The presentations are and, and recording will be made available online. All attendees are in listen only mode. Uh, please raise your hand to send a chat message if you have any problems with your connection or audio and one of the Syria team will help you out. There will be plenty of time for questions uh, after the presentations. So please, during the sessions, type your questions into the Q&A box uh, and state if you wish to direct your question to a particular speaker. We will monitor questions as they come in. Um, but a handy little feature is that you can uh, click the thumbs up uh, on other people's questions to help us identify which ones are the most popular amongst the audience. Please also share resources in the chat. Uh, we will also be conducting some audience polls, so more on that later. Please also feel free to share your views and experiences with us today using the Twitter handles at Syria Updates uh, and also the hashtags shown there. We do aim to be finished at 11 o'clock today. So just a little background on Syria, um, just a quick overview on who we are for those that aren't fully aware. We recently celebrated our 60th anniversary as a not-for-profit member-based organisation. Our core strength has always been improving performance through collaboration in the built environment and construction sectors. We do this by delivering independent guidance, such as the SUDS manual, the ROC manual, International Levy Handbook, the Asbestos Guide, Biodiversity Net Gain Guidance. Uh, and, and as many of you will know, we, we do have a particularly strong legacy on asset management and geotechnical guides such as this one, including the Embedded Retaining Walls Guide, Hidden Defects in Bridges, structural health monitoring, UAVs, non-destructive testing, and most recently, GIS for infrastructure. We organize around 50 events per year, mostly online at present, ranging from topical conferences, annual debates and lectures, to webinars on our guidance documents, such as today's topic. We are we're a small but growing organization with around 80 members, which you can see on the slide just here. And it's good to see a number of you here today at the webinar. So what really brings us together today? Uh, Earth observation encompasses an extremely broad suite of technologies that have come of age over the past 15 to 20 years and are expanding into a new era of cloud processing, very high resolution and near real-time service delivery. Uh, technological improvements have brought space-born EO data products to the point where their spatial and temporal resolutions are of immediate relevance and benefit to the infrastructure community. Uh, infrastructure asset stakeholders can now make use of the globally available cost-effective space-born solutions to address their need to map, measure, uh, and monitor multi-scale, rapidly changing and spatially complex assets of all kinds. So to fully capitalize on these Earth observation solutions, that their benefits and the necessary steps for their uptake, they, they need to be clear and readily understandable to the asset owner to ensure that access and adoption need to be as easy and practicable as possible. So these guidelines are essentially aimed at improving accessibility to earth observation technology by providing a solid understanding of techniques and products as applied to infrastructure management. 
I would like to take a moment to thank the funders of this guidance document, without whom we would not have been able to produce this incredibly valuable piece of work. So just a quick thank you to Geofem, National Highways, Network Rail, SatSense, SixSense, SLR Consulting, Telespazio, Trey Altamira, Welsh Government and WSP. I would also like to uh, thank the members of the Project Steering Group who, uh, as, as I just mentioned, would, that their contributions have been invaluable throughout the development of this guidance. On to the program. Uh, during the webinar, you will see, you, you'll gain insight from the project team as they provide an overview of the guide and its findings. Learn why the new guidance is essential to the infrastructure asset management industry and hear generally how INSAR and Earth observation can be strategically used to aid the efficient management of infrastructure assets and be able to see a snapshot of industry case studies as well. I'm delighted to be joined today by Ian McKenzie, uh, Principal Geotechnical Engineer from Welsh Government, James Codd, Associate Director, Ground Engineering from ACOM, uh, Dr. Philippa Mason, Senior Lecturer and Lead Author of the Guide uh, from Imperial College London, and Dr. Noria Duranthri Arasa, uh, who's an INSAR Technical Manager at Six Sense, and is also a contributing author on the guidance. So I do actually have, uh, as I mentioned, we do have, um, just before we hear from our first speaker, we do have a couple of audience polls. So I'll just launch the first one. Okay, so something should have popped up on your screen now, just a pop-up box with the questions, uh, are you already using Earth Observation and Insight in your daily work? And if that's a yes or no, if, if you answered yes to the first poll, which kinds of Earth Observation technology are you using? Uh, which is a multiple choice. So feel free to pick many of those there. Just give a couple more, 20 seconds maybe, just to see how, how this goes. Okay, so that's good to see that the majority of you here today do, do uh, use Earth observation or INSAR in your, in your work today. So this webinar will be of direct relevance and hopefully the guidance as well. Uh, ground deformation detection using INSAR, change detection and digital elevation modeling. Yep, all very good points that are discussed in the guide and I'm sure you'll hear more about later today. So thank you for that. All right, now. On to the first presentation by Ian McKenzie from the Welsh Government. Uh, Ian will set the scene and share a government perspective on the use of INSAR and Earth observation within asset management. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Jack. Welcome everyone to this launch event. Thanks for attending. My name is uh, Ian McKenzie. I'm a geotechnical engineer. I'm working in the transportation department of the Welsh Government. And I've been the joint chair of this uh, project steering group as well, that produced the Syria report. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background from a client's perspective before handing over to the authors to give you a bit more of the, the, the detail of what it is. To do that, I, I really need to explain a little bit about my background and what I do as a client. Um, I, and this is not going to be a presentation, this is just going to be me speaking for five minutes. I am first and foremost, I'm, a, I'm an asset manager. I am responsible for maintaining about 4,000 kilometres of earthworks along the Welsh strategic road network. So in Wales, transportation is a devolved function, and the Welsh ministers have direct responsibility for anything that's to do with the trunk roads and the motorway network. And the SRN, it, it represents about 3% of all classified roads in Wales, but it accounts for about 30% of all vehicle movements. It's, it's also one of the highest value assets that the Welsh Government owns, so it features in all their Future Generations Act, their climate change adaptation plans, Welsh transport strategy. And in short, it's, it's one of the major concerns for the Welsh people. We get a lot of correspondence in the transportation department. We are 
an overseeing organization. We're equivalent to the National Highways uh, in England, and we largely follow the same frameworks and standards. And geotechnically, the, the asset that I manage is, is a diverse mix of earthworks, you know, varying ages and sizes, different compositions, covering floodplains, high mountain passes, rural and urban environments. And it's an old asset, a lot of unplanned development, and we're dealing with the legacy of the Industrial Revolution in a lot of places. So that, as well as the usual list of geohazards that we deal with, so landslides, subsidence, rockfall events, river scour. So really what I do is I inspect, I monitor, I manage conditions, and I repair where I have to. We do build new assets, but not very often. And really, what do I do? What do I rely on to do all this? Well, it's a combination of engineering experience and technology. Yeah, technology. Um, I grew up in Scotland in the 1980s and when the North Sea oil industry was booming. And at the time, they said they had, they thought they had about 30 years worth of recoverable hydrocarbons. Um, 40 years of intensive extraction later, and they still think they've got about 30 years worth of recoverable hydrocarbons. And that's largely down to the improvements in technology. And really, I hope to do something similar with the lifespan of my assets that I manage. I want to extend their working life through improved management, and that's going to be delivered via technological development. Now, of course, any new technique has to find its place into existing managing regimes. And they have to prove their worth, particularly in a cost-conscious and risk-averse environment like civil engineering. And so what impact is a new technology? What must I make? Well, it really has to help me solve problems. Um, earthworks deteriorate, and it's hard to know exactly how much reliable life I have left in them. So obviously there's key things like the geometry plays a major role, the constituent materials, methods of construction, drainage is always a problem. Uh, I've got a whole legacy of issues, and, and we fix those problems via engineering interventions, but it's expensive, and it can also be slow. We're, we're working to modern design standards, we're working to modern standards of safety. We have statutory restrictions, there's always land issues, and public scrutiny has never been faster um, at the moment. And on top of all that, we have climate change to, 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 to contend with as well, with higher rainfalls, more storm events, hotter summers, colder winters. And really what we're trying to do from an asset management point of view is move away from a reactive pattern of management. But that means the timing of any intervention is absolutely crucial. And to do that, I need the best possible data. And that's definitely where INSAR and Earth Observation fits into it. One of the things I've learned from being involved in the Seri report is just, you know, what, what an extensive mature space industry is actually out there. But I'm not sure exactly what impact they've had on engineering in the UK. I mean, I obviously work with an awful lot of uh, highways engineers and consultants, and, and anecdotally, I think there's a very high level of awareness of NSAR, and probably a fairly limited experience. And generally, I would say a fairly shallow understanding. That's been my experience. There's a lot of suspicion about cost. Um, there's a lot of suspicion about effectiveness and, and possibly in the past some overselling. Um, I read a lot of reports about managing earthworks and there's always a recommendation at the end that something like earth observation should be considered. But I sometimes feel that people put things like that in as a stock response, not really understanding what, what they're suggesting. I very much hope that this report will shift that understanding in, in the UK geotechnical industry. And certainly, looking back through this report, you know, for this, you know, I, I'm I'm really pleased about the amount of focus it has on infrastructure and asset management, and not just geotechnical asset management. And, and really, what it's trying to do, or what it does, is it provides that independent, practical instruction, and it's not full of jargon, which I was quite pleased about. And really, you know, the, like the final sign of effectiveness, is that I would say, is is that about three years ago when I started my involvement in this project, I wasn't using any NSAR techniques at all in my management strategy. And I, I now have two quite large long-term problems on the, the Welsh road network that NSAR is playing a central role. So I've got quite a large relic landslide where the risk of reactivation is being actively managed by a strategy based on earth observation. And I've also got a long-term subsidence site where uh, back analysis you know, in time series NSAR has, has, has really changed our understanding of the underlying causes and therefore what solutions we'll, we'll, we'll go for. I wouldn't necessarily 
be on this path uh, without insights from the PSG. So thanks to everyone that's been involved with it so far. And I think I'm going to leave it there. And I might pass over to the authors who will give you a lot more detail. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Um, really interesting insight into, into how you have, have already adopted the, the guide and, and the learnings from it. Uh, it's really good to hear. Uh, please do type questions for Ian and all of the speakers moving forward uh, into the question box and we will pick them up in the discussion shortly. Uh, please remember also to click the thumbs up just to let us know which ones are the more popular ones. Uh, we're now going to hear from James Cobb from ACOM. Uh, James will talk about an INSAR collaboration between National Highways, ACOM and Arab. So over to you, James. Thank you very much, Jack. And thank you very much, Ian, for the introductions. Um, thanks for asking me to join you today and to everyone for attending. So I'll be talking about a project which I first talked about at the launch of this Syria project um, back in July 2019 when the world was a very different place. Um, this, this project aligned quite nicely with the Syria project in terms of uh, the, the, the dates that, it, you know, it's, this project started at a similar time and this project ended in December, just gone. Um, so the two worked quite well in tandem and um, I think we all benefited from, from both projects. Um, so that, that earlier presentation introduced some of the challenges that National Highways has uh, in relation to uh, geotechnical asset management and how it undertakes its inspections and monitoring. Um, and that presentation introduced se several projects that we were undertaking at the time that were aligned to overcome those challenges. Um, so, yeah, at that time, I was National Highways Programme Leader. Um, and I, I, I only left National Highways at the end of last year. Uh, and this, this was actually one of the projects that I wanted to finish up before moving over to ACOM in, in January. Um, so yeah, this is a National Highways project delivered by Arup and ACOM. Um, there's a few people at Arup who uh, made very, very significant contributions and they, 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 were, they were named in the PSG for this, Ollie, Ollie Pritchard um, would have been contributing to this presentation, but he's on leave today, um, but he's certainly worth uh, a mention. So briefly, um, I'll, I'll do an introduction to the project and the program that this forms part of. I'll set the context and you'll probably see a lot of similarity in the context between what I say and what Ian's already said uh, just over the, the border. Um, then I'll summarize some of the site trials that we did and some of the EO techniques that we used in those trials. And then I'll finalize with um, a summary of what the project delivered. Right, so, so this project, uh, geotechnical asset improvement, remote inspection using earth observation techniques formed uh, part of a larger program of works uh, which is outlined on the right. This is National Highways Geotechnical Climate Change Adaptation Program, which is overseen by Arab and ACOM, but involves lots of other parties, some, are, some of who are seen in the audience today. Um, so we've got Mopsa involved with that. We've got uh, TRL and Coffee and Winter Associates contributing. Um, over on the left is the resilience program which preceded the climate change adaptation program but that included several uh, remote survey tasks that fed into this one um, so those yeah there's a few of those on the left they they those sort of focused on more near surface survey techniques um, and they resulted in various guidance um, 
and, and left Earth observation as area of interest, which is where this, this project picked up. Uh, a lot of those reports are, are available on, on GBMS for those that have access. Um, so the aim of this project was really to better understand Earth observation and INSAR, uh, demystify some of the uh, some of the aspects that Ian introduced and and get the two the geotechnical industry and the insar industry talking in a language they could both both understand um, okay so i'll just run through some of those challenges and this is where you'll see the similarities with what ian had to say i thought i thought it was interesting to hear from ian some of the statistics that i'm used to hearing from an english perspective um, so that, that was quite good. So yeah, the challenges that National Highways faces are outlined on the top right. We've got uh, the headline three challenges are climate climate change um, and a number of temperature and weather related uh, factors in there as well. The fact that many of the geotechnical assets on the strategic road network are aging. Many were built in the 60s and 70s uh, with a design life that was anticipated to be about 60 years so we're approaching that that intended design life now and looking at ways to extend them uh, and that final challenge is 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 demand um, now these challenges have come to the top of the list of national highways priorities in the last five or ten years over a time that we've seen uh, the network modified quite a bit to accommodate extra traffic. So we've seen more, more lanes go in, we've seen um, more special geotechnical measures go into steepened slopes and um, support other highway assets. And that's made the highway environment quite hostile for geotechnical inspectors. So we've had to look at other ways of um, inspecting the network because we've, it's, it's, it's meant we've had to bring in traffic management, which comes at quite a cost and cause quite a disruption for road users. So we need to reduce that. Um, so yeah, earth observations, is something that's been used in other geoscience industries quite successfully. Um, and I think that as, as Ian said, the barriers, a lot of it was in communication. So this project was about breaking those barriers down getting everyone talking, getting everyone understanding the, the issues, talking a similar language. And that, that sort of, you know, that goes back to understanding what's, what is a cutting, what is an embankment, uh, and, you know, what satellites are up there, what sensors are on those satellites, what, what, what can they actually do? So I will go straight into the, the trials. There were, I think we had 10, 10 or 11 trials. Um, and we engaged with, I think, seven or eight different suppliers, seven or eight different INSAR suppliers providing different sorts of data. Uh, we ended up taking five of those suppliers into the trials. Um, there was sort of various various constraints that meant others didn't come in. And some of that was cost, some of that was confidence, um, some of it was contractual. Um, so yeah, the five, the five that we, we brought forward were, they offered a, ran a range of different techniques. Uh, and it's probably worth adding that, although we had five suppliers, not every supplier provided data for every site. So some, some knew they could meet the challenges on some sites, some were less confident, uh, some, were, some were very open, provided data for every site to show where it would work and also where, where it wouldn't work. Uh, so I've actually lost the slide here. Uh, so the first, I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk through that first slide. I'm not quite sure where it's gone. 
Oh, sorry. No, this is it. This is it. Okay. So the first, yeah, the first was a regional scale. I've labeled it area scale there for some reason, which threw me a little bit. Um, so the first region, the first regional scale that we looked at was focused on the north, the northeast, the northeast region. Um, so that covers a large, a large, very large area with, with lots of different sorts of hazards and lots of areas of interest, lots of different defects. Um, so within that area, we've picked up uh, some particular areas of interest. There's the, uh, the A628, which is in the uh, Peak District, I think, between Sheffield and Manchester, uh, where, the, where the road crosses uh, um, a lot of Peak Moreland. Now, we were given a warning with the data that said the observations in peat can be quite variable. Um, and they, they were quite open and said that they wouldn't recommend the use of INSAR for measuring ground movement in peat. And that was attributed to the vegetation and the impact of vegetation on SAR coherence. I suspect it's probably something to do with the, the way that the vegetation in the ground becomes saturated and dries out quite, quite quickly. Um, and, you know, we could see that in the data, we could see that change. And you know we could see why cautions needed in in P areas. Uh, so another area is the A1 Morpeth bypass, which is some of the some of the oldest earthworks in the country, and quite a, quite a few defects relating to slope stability. Uh, and that is the site that's shown on the right. There, uh, on the top right, is a extract from uh, National Highways Geotechnical data repository uh, with the defects shown on the other side of the carriageway in various colours and they, they correlate, there's a correlation there between some of the PS INSAR reflector points and the observations and that, that is, there's that graph at the, at the bottom which shows the general trend over, over, the, over the years that were looked at and that, and that correlates well. Uh, the other sites that we looked at, the M62, near Castleford and Wakefield. Um, again, significant movement, this time over areas of, 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 of open cast mining and then they've been in field. Um, and the A, A1M, which, which was an area that uh, people might remember was in the news after a crown hole opened up on one of the major projects in 2000 and 2017. Uh, so, so within within this regional study, there was a there was a clear difference between um, point density in rural and urban sites, which I think was probably to be anticipated. But it's good to see that confirmed in the data. Um, so, two two of those sites that I've referred to are rural, remote, and two two are relatively urban in comparison. Okay, moving on to the root, the root scale trials. So if this is three, 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 three trials uh, at a scale that geotechnic classic managers might use to define a series of physical inspections. Um, and again, a range of different environmental conditions and, diff and different highway, highway geometries. Um, now these sites were picked to allow comparison of the algorithms and to identify what sort of constraints might affect data collection. So they included the north-south orientated M1, uh, Sheffield to Wakefield, which is also in the northeast region, like, like, the, last, like the last trial. Uh, several steep aging slopes dating back to the early 60s and several defects associated with coal mining. Um, And those, those, those defects correlated with um, National Highway's coal mining risk map, which, was, which is on GDMS, so you can see that. that. That was something that was prioritized as a result of that, crawl, coal, that crown hole that I mentioned on the, on the last slide. Um, so at, at, this, at this site, there was quite a, a, a noticeable difference between the, the point densities of different suppliers. So it was quite clear 
uh, that different algorithms using the same data can give quite different results. Uh, and I think, I think confidence comes into that as well. So a good correlation with some of the slip related defects. Uh, now, I think that one of, the, one of those defects couldn't, couldn't be accessed by foot in, in when it was last inspected um, due to vegetation. Uh, and this area was noted to be heavily vegetated, but vegetation is us usually considered to be uh, quite challenging for, it, for INSAR generally. Um, but in, in, this, in this case, it, it wasn't. And that's possibly something that C-band INSAR is relatively good at, is, is penetrating the vegetation. Um, another site we looked at was the M11 M25 junction near Harlow, and that was picked because it's on London clay, London clay embankments. Um, so high plasticity clay that's vulnerable to shrink, shrink swell. And this is the, the image relating to that on the right. Um, and you can, you, you've got some really good cyclic movement there that, that you'd expect with, with shrink swell. So a nice correlation, nice correlation there. Um, so this, this scale trial also looked at the M4. Um, this, this considered persistent scatterer in SAR, and it also used SAR imagery from a commercial satellite, uh, L-Ban SAR, to look at soil moisture. Um, now, this section of the M4 is noted to have uh, several drainage defects. So, you know, it was a good test on, on how, how useful that L-band SAR might be. Um, and there was, there was a lot of useful correlation from that. Um, it's probably worth noting that that assessment went beyond the algorithms and introduced some weighted failure susceptibility models. Uh, and that combined soil and moisture with slope angles to identify areas of risk. Uh, and I think there was some lessons learned on that, um, principally around the importance of data quality and data cleansing. So there was some, although you know there was a lot of correlation, there was there was also areas of uh, false false readings. There were areas identified that as as high risks that with with better data would wouldn't have. Um, so that you know that, that really does emphasise the importance of data quality, which I'm sure many geotechnical engineers are aware of anyway. But there you go. Okay. Um, so the next the next size the next size of sort of site we're looking at was asset scale. Um, so we got several assets that we looked at: one, two, three, four, five, five different sorts of assets up and down the country. Um, A66 in the Lake District, uh, it's a north-south section of the highway uh, running alongside the shore of the Bassenthwaite Lake um, where the, there's, there's, there's wave action at the, at the bottom of the slope and that's caused a few uh, defects associated with the removal of the tow support to the highway slopes. Um, now this is a very remote site. Uh, I think we had two, we had two suppliers provide data for this. Um, very few persistent reflectors were picked up. Um, one supplier's data showed some rapid ground movement um, over winter. And that, that correlated with known defects. Um, factors that I think limited the points being picked up were probably the steep northeast facing slopes which might cause shadowing of the reflector uh vegetation was a factor and possibly um the the, the surface of the lake itself uh the next site down on the m5 near gloucester is a great separated junction um two off slips two on slips um there is a tension cracking creep movement um, the site is monitored with several inclinometers and piezos due to the risk. Um, 
so you know we've got lots of lots of data to look at lots of data to compare with and, and quite a lot to know about that site um, so again quite variable point density between the two suppliers that provided the ps inside data for that um, i think one of the suppliers showed uh picked up quite a bit in a nearby depot very little on the on the slopes or on the highway pavement the other data did pick up uh, a downward trend in the ground movement close to one of the defect locations uh, which correlated quite well and it also identified several points on the main carriageway in the pavement in the vicinity of a, a an observation on a geotechnical measure a cracking block work and, and mortar slope. So a good correlation there, albeit on the pavement asset rather than the geotechnical asset. Um, A42 Lount Tip near Derby. Um, this might be one that some of you are familiar with. Uh, it's an area of historic open cast mining. So the highway embankment is constructed out of colliery spoil. Um, several defects, um, differential movements, tension cracks. Um, slope bulges, terracing. Uh, so the results showed a quite similar variation in point density between the suppliers. Um, relatively few points on the geotechnical assets. Good coverage on the highway pavement again. Um, and you know these these showed a, a history of movement that was consistent with the field observations that have been put onto GDMS. Um, a56 Woodcliffe is a particularly interesting site. It's one of National Highway's more significant landslides, and I, th I suspect it's probably one of the most one of the most rapid. Um, this this site has been monitored for over ten years, and I think between 2011 and 2015 there was two two and a half meters of movement um, measured using surface pegs. So again, another another site where we've got lots of data from um, historical monitoring and previous inspections. So lots, lots to compare with. Um, so this site used PSN SAR, but uh, very, very few uh, points picked up. Um, it also used DN SAR, distributed in SAR. And these are the images on the right hand side. Um, so this is quite a different technique, which is explained in the the Syria guide, uh, near complete coverage, and it picked up areas of, of movement with, with a good correlation. Um, the, the image in the middle is the, the DNSAR extract. Uh, the area, the, the image at the bottom is um, ground movement from the in situ monitoring. So it, it's not a direct, there's not a direct correlation, but there's general trends of movement that were picked up. Um, now, I think the magnitudes were different as well. So I think the magnitude of movement was shown to be lower in the inside data than it was in the monitoring data. But general can it confirmed the sort of, you know, the general trends um, and showed where where it can fit into it, where inside can fit into an overall sort of strategy for inspections and monitoring. And then the final, the final asset scale site on the A627, uh, east-west facing slopes, defects, including a, a, a class 1A a major defect, conical depression and minor step defects, scarps, errors of slipping, bulging. Again, notable difference in PS inside point density between different suppliers, going back to the uh, the algorithms and the confidence they've got in, in those algorithms and how they understand the, the challenges we've got. Um, uh, this, this site, I think, identified a couple of quite sharp movements in the, in the vicinity of the major defect. Um, and then I think that was it, what was that, 20, 2020? And then at the end of 2020, that, that persistent scatterer, that, that persistent point disappeared so it might it might have gone it was it was lost and it was couldn't reliably be tracked um, and, and that's that's useful information itself uh okay so that's that's the asset scale trials um so just a few a few others to cover um 
We did a scheme trial on the A27 east of Lewis, between Lewis and Eastbourne, where there's quite a lot of construction work going on for a, a, a major project. Um, now this, this, although this used PS INSAR, it was used, it was used uh, slightly differently, and it was used alongside satellite imagery, uh, digital terrain modeling, and a land cover assessment. It was an interesting study. You know, it's good to see construction changing, construction happening in progress over, over the year. Um, the, the analysis of the data was quite time consuming. And at the end, it, it didn't really add any significant benefits that uh, weren't already understood through, through the construction work going on the ground. It might have an application in the future when construction becomes more automated. So there's, there's technology there to watch. Um, it also, the site also includes quite a significant landslide at Selmiston um, and the, the route of the, the, the new, there's a new cycle route going into that site and it's the cycle route is gonna avoid the landslide. Now the, the data did pick up the landslide um, and it picked up ground movement in the landslide, but it wasn't considered to be significant. And that, and that may well be because there wasn't significant movement over that time. Uh, so the last the last site that I'll mention is the M25 Flint Hall Farm and Rick's Nest landslide, which is probably the country's largest landslide uh, affecting the strategic road network. And it affects part of the network that is probably amongst the, the busiest, the M25 near Godstone, um, junction six, between the A23 and the A21. Uh, so this is this is on a DBFO, uh, which is contracted out to Connect Plus. So it, it took a bit of time to get things to happen at this site, and it was it was delayed because of COVID. But um, thanks to Connect Plus, Atkins, as well, and also Imperial. Um, so at this site, we installed two two corner reflectors, which are shown in that photo, um, primarily to allow uh, a retrospective analysis of inside data in the future. So we can put these in, we can leave it there, it'll be picking up data for years to come and, and we can come and look back at that later. Um, and the data that's been collected to date has been used by Imperial, I think, to improve some of the algorithms that, that they're using. Um, okay, so that just sort of leaves the, the final deliverables to go through then. So these, there's a series of reports which are on GDMS accessible to anyone who has access. And there's a series of three guidance notes which are accessible to anybody with or without GDMS access through that link at the top. So feel free to go and have a look at those. Um, people might have read, a, there was an article in GE Magazine last year, which Ollie wrote. Um, and we'll be talking about this project at the Resilience Conference in Cardiff next month. Um, and there's a few case studies in the Syria guide. That's it from me. Thank, thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Uh, really interesting to see some of the case studies and, and, and how you've applied that knowledge and, and seeing all the data on, on the graphs is really interesting as well. Um, we are now actually going to hear from the lead authors, uh, Dr. Philippa Mason from Imperial College London and uh, Nuria Duran Three Arasa from Sixth Sense. They will take us through the guidance, uh, give us an introduction to the document, its contents and how to use it, while providing a sneak peek at some of the case studies discussed in the guide. So over to you, Philippa. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, can, you, can you hear? Am I, am I loud and clear? Yes, great. Fantastic. Well, um, firstly, uh, let me just try and move my slide on. Mm. Here we go, wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you to Syria for the invitation. Thank you all for attending. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to provide this short overview of the new Syria guidelines on Earth observation and in infrastructure. On behalf of the author team, 
who are uh, named on the screen. Um, so myself and, and Nuria are, are, are present here to present um, and uh, answer any questions you have at the end. Um, so by way of a sort of snapshot, uh, skeleton of what I shall cover in this um, introduction, um, here's a kind of an agenda for you. Um, the first two of which I'd like to talk about um, kind of important um, and go hand in hand uh, is the, the wider context for these guidelines, uh, the landscape that they sit inside, uh, and then that you know that that leads with to the, the motivation for them, why why um, these guidelines needed to be written, um, and wh where where we're going with them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the author team and the the structure of, of the of the team that put them together, the and then um, a few tasters of the contents of the guide, some of the technical stuff. Uh, the methods and and then these uh, wonderful and important examples, the case studies. Um, also, a little bit about the the guide and how it should be used, and and you know the um, which elements it's 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 aimed at, or which levels and which kind of communities it's aimed at. Um, and finally, our thoughts on what its value might be to industry. Um, so, um, let's step back for a minute. The, the, the context for these guidelines is there are actually several really important points in here. Um, uh, the top of which is uh, widely recognized growing importance of the space sector um, in all its respects, upstream, downstream, space data, uh, and that includes Earth observation uh, in tackling a wide number of environmental problems, challenges, um, not just in the UK, but worldwide. And I think We've probably all heard the UK government talking about its intention to grow this sector um, over the next, you know, the coming decades. Um, so that's a very important sort of backdrop for all of this. And, and I'm old enough to have seen, uh, you know, to start at, in Earth observation in the, in the 90s, in the mid 90s, and, and I've seen a lot of this change. And I find myself um, amongst my students, and I feel like I'm actually on trend for once because they're suddenly realizing how important this technology is. Uh, secondly, that there, and this has been touched on by Ian um, as well as by James, um, the growing demand for really objective, cost effective, precise, reliable information about the environment and particularly the ground. Um, and uh, I think he mentioned something about overselling. And, and uh, again, I, I can remember when everybody was very excited about Earth observation and what it could do. And it's taken a little while for that to become relevant and, um, per, you know, and to be able to satisfy some of the demands of this infrastructure industry that we're talking about here today. Um, and that's largely been about precision, but also about regularity um, and cost effectiveness. And I think you know anybody who's involved in satellite imaging will argue vigorously that actually, you know, once you've got a satellite in orbit, using that data, it's pretty cost effective per square kilometer, even after considering the time you spend processing. So this is an important technology, uh, and and again, um, that fact or well, these two facts um, uh, means that we have this growing fleet of, um, of satellites of one kind or another. Um, there are now something like 1,800 actively uh, operating Earth observation satellites in orbit at any one time. Um, and so, um, and this changes a lot of things. It's, you know, reliability, regularity, sorry, regularity, uh, spatial resolution, temporal resolution, um, precision, all those things have come together. Um, this is a perfect time. Um, and then lastly, very exciting, exciting, very exciting for me, uh, the launch of the European Ground Promotion Service, this, this Copernicus um, initiative to deliver millimeter scale, or millimeter accuracy motion, uh, ground motion measurements across an entire continent. This is unprecedented. It's so exciting. It's taken a long time to pull off. Um, and and it's uh, if, even if you're if you've never used InSub before or you're not actually using it at work or you never will, it's just interesting to go and look and see what the ground is doing. So all these things together make an important backdrop. And um, in terms of, you know, they, they kind of inform the motivation for these guidelines. And um, Ian also talked about a kind of misinformation in, in the community or mystique, I think, or mystery. Um, we all uh, recognize that there was a, a great need to better inform potential communities um, 
that might use this technology. And um, I think it's been widely talked about that the real potential of Earth observation has not been fully embraced. It's um, not reaching you know, everybody who could and should be using it. So we wanted to try and somehow help that process. Um, and user concern is a big part of that, trustworthiness, maturity of the technology, all these things needed to be dealt with somehow. Uh, so that's, you know, th those are two big motivations for writing it. Um, and so the objectives for the contents um, were, we, all, we, we discussed this at great length um, in our um, early meetings. Um, we felt as, te as technical people, all of us wanted to present the state of the art in the Earth observation across all of it. We talked great length about what should and shouldn't be in the guidelines. I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and that there should be a special focus on, on you know, interferometric synthetic aperture radar. Um, uh, because it, that is one of the things which has become incredibly mature and, and is, has now arrived um, at the kind of detail that is necessary for civil engineering and infrastructure. So that has to have a special focus in these guidelines. So we talk about how it works, all of the techniques from the basic physical principles right the way through to the um, every kind of method you can think of. Um, but there's also some high level guidance, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there are um, copious tables, if you like, you know, individual documents to describe the methods, and I'll talk about that too, um, with pointers to you know, further de more detailed references, anybody who wants it. Um, we stress that this is not a textbook. Um, it is designed to bridge the gap between um, research and uh, technical knowledge and the user community that needs to access this information and make the most of it. Uh, and then that leads directly on to um, the most wonderful and unique part about this, which is the industrial case studies. These excellent examples um, of how all these different techniques have been used, um, some of which James has just been describing to you. Uh, and the last section in the guide is a comment on the, the maturity of the techniques, where we think the industry is going um, and the need for, for international standards, because there aren't many. So our target audience is, I guess, I can't see you out there, but you guys Asset owners, engineers, uh, decision makers, um, planning projects, people who've got budgets to, 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 to plan out, to flesh out, um, as well as the stakeholders who are, have any, anything in, any, involved in any way in um, asset management. That's, so that's the scope. So let's talk a little bit about the team. Um, we, I cannot quite remember whether Sixth Sense approached us or we approached them, it, it doesn't really matter. It was a marriage made in heaven. Um, and we realized very quickly that we had lots of complementarity and um, a lot of skills that, we, that were pertinent for the writing of these guidelines. And we put together a team, a little consortium, and we were lucky enough uh, to convince Syria to, to give us the, the job to write these guidelines. And um, we didn't do them alone, as you can see on the right. This, uh, the group together, our consortium, alongside the, 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 um, the project steering group, um, which again, sort of spans um, the, the users, the, the, the assets, managers, the engineers, all the way through to the data providers um, and government. Uh, so we, between us, consortium and the steering group, we cover all, all sorts of uh, aspects. Um, of the work and the, the technology that we're, we're talking about. Um, the Knowledge Transfer Network also were part of the team. Um, they helped us to get in touch with, with people to provide some of the case studies. Um, their role is to, again, to be a link between you know, the practice um, or the research and the, and the technology and then the people who might use it. So that's, that's how it all was structured. Um, and their advice, the, the steering group um, and, and their advice were, was invaluable. Um, for ourselves, for Sixth Sense and, and Imperial College, we quickly realized that we actually had a, a huge number of relevant collect connections um, uh, all over the world and in all different sort of uh, uh, you know, spheres of um, the infrastructure industry. Um, so Sixth Sense client base, uh, but also um, our collaborators, so, were the wonderful icons of which are, are available on screen and there's lots of overlap here with some of the, the organizations that, Syria, that Ian talked about within Syria. So we realized we had a um, we were very well connected in a very and we had very complementary skills. Um, 
um, which are kind of reflected a bit here um, across the whole of Earth observation. So Sixth Sense has a, an INSAR atlas, um, so it has this wonderful data portal, it has a processing chain, um, and, um, and it has all, all kinds of other initiatives about resilience to climate change. So those two things are really important together. They also do other kinds of mapping. Um, so you know, uh, these guidelines are about optical imaging techniques as well as INSAR. And so they have a, a mapping team that deals with um, all of those things. Uh, and here at Imperial, um, we, you know, and Imperial stands for itself, it's a big university, um, and our Earth observation part of it is, we're tiny minnows actually within the college, but um, we kind of punch above our weight. Uh, we have a research group which is dedicated to um, the kind of this sort of uh, fusion between geotechnics uh, and Earth observation, and we have a number of PhD students who are working in this sphere together, um, uh, as well as undergraduate students, and, um, and we're well published and hopefully well thought of. Um, and we now have a, a newly established Earth observation network uh, across college, which is designed to be cross-disciplinary um, atmospheres, uh, vegetation, life sciences, but there's also the Earth sciences where, where I sit, and I'm lucky enough to be co-leader of that. So. Um, as a team, we bring all kinds of very complementary um, expertise, but also um, uh, experience and, and connections. So we felt we looked quite good on paper, and here we are. Um, so to the contents of the guide, the exciting bit. So the technical overview, uh, as I said, you know, it's uh, we wanted it to be a state of the art sort of description. We want we really wanted to have. Um, technical detail in it. Uh, there was some discussion over this. Um, I stress it's not a textbook, but it does go across all of the, 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 you know, the nuts and bolts of how this works from electromagnetic radiation right the way through, um, the physical principles of how we remotely sense things on the ground or anywhere for that matter. Um, so we also go through the sensors that are, are, are pertinent in different parts of the, of the technological landscape um, and the data sets and what those, what those data mean, the raw data, um, and all those different elements of the earth observation and landscape as we describe it, um, all the major types of technology that are, that are pertinent to infrastructure. We've not covered everything. Um, and, and again, we discussed this at length, and there are other guides that cover other things like LIDAR or UAVs. Um, and these guidelines are, are firmly focused on um, space-borne technology um, rather than airborne, but many of the things overlap. Um, so uh, you know, this, is, this is part of a, of a wider framework, but it's been focused and written with infrastructure in mind. Um, so we put quite a lot of emphasis on the, the, the data and the techniques which are pertinent to these precise measurements um, from space, or precise observations from space. So there's a, there's a big section on, on, on radar and on, on INSAR, how it works, the key concepts are the geometry of how, how these things work, um, what it's capable of, uh, clearly there are lots of strengths, um, how precise, uh, what are the errors, uh, and very importantly, um, what are the limitations? Because there, in, there are situations where it doesn't function that well, and James has touched on that a little bit. Um, and it's important to say, though, to be, to be upfront about those things. And what are the errors and where is it not useful so that you enter, you enter into this framework um, in an advised way? Um, so that's a major section. Um, and in there, there are, um, in that technical overview, are pointers towards um, the methods tables, um, which cover each of those, each of the different approaches, the processing of, um, methodologies, if you like, to tackling a particular kind of data to deliver a particular kind of product. Um, so the, all the techniques are pointed at all the various methods which are presented in a series of tables. Um, and here we try to present uh, full technical descriptions of each type of method um, for both optical remote sensing, but also for obviously for radar and, and INSAR. Uh, all the limitations, all the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the spatial resolutions and wavelengths and what they're good for and what they're not good for. And, um, and again, with pointers towards um, the literature, key, key elements in the literature for those who want and need to know more. 
Um, there's also some high level description um, for those who've never heard of any of some of these techniques um, to kind of just explain very gently um, what the overall purpose is of this particular method. Um, and, and there's quite a lot of them. Um, and again, these are also linked to the industrial case studies that deal with those particular techniques. So the, the idea is that the, the guidelines, every stage of the guidelines are, are linked, cross-linked, cross-referenced, if you like, from each element. So if you read something, you go to a case study, read something, there's a link back to the particular method. Um, and if you need to know the first principles, there's a, you know, there's a link to the section in the, the technical overview. So it's all designed to be joined up thinking. Um, so then onto the case studies, which is the, the wonderful, unique and elegant part about the, the guidelines. And um, so a lot were considered and we discussed whether they should be UK only or um, what, should they, you know, how, what should they be focused on? What should we do? And then we decided they should all be industrial. Um, it's all real projects. And some of them are, that many of them are in the UK, but many are also in other countries. Um, we can all learn from each other after all. So this first one on the screen is actually from six, one of Six Senses projects, the beloved Elizabeth line, very close to my heart, transformed my commuting life. Um, and this project was in, in, in monitoring the progress of the, of the tunnel construction. Um, and uh, we've all seen, um, beautiful images, and there's one of which is, is actually behind me. Um, and here they're using time series in SAR um, from a high resolution SAR satellite, um, monitored every day, every 11 days. Um, and um, in, in the, each of the case study documents, the information um, goes from you know, the title and the, what the overall objectives of the project were. And it deals with um, briefly um, the, the, the service provider, uh, in question, in this case, Sixth Sense, um, the data set used, the, pr the processing methodology used, um, and then some selected really um, key illustrations to, to, to show um, what the results looked like, what they consisted of. Um, then there's some lessons learned at the bottom, some advantages, some limitations, and some more references where, where, where applicable. So you see illustrations exactly like this. You have a map and, a, and then a result showing these persistent scatterer uh, measurement points on the ground with a color scale, importantly, um, showing you what's moving, what's not. So, um, and I think all of the, the case studies follow a similar, um, same format, uh, but with different techniques. So the second example I have here is an optic, uh, is, is uh, using an opt optical imagery approach um, in Cyprus, this is a, uh, about the geomorphology. So here is the integration of um, very high resolution optical imaging with digital elevation models for terrain analysis um, and in situ data and, and field observations. So a slightly different project. Um, and this is about slope stability. Um, and here, you know, some of the, the examples of this, you can see this is a, although this is a rural example, uh, it has a major impact on, on the roads. Um, so each of these case studies try to illustrate the data um, and the results and, and some of the context so that you get a picture of the, the scale um, of what's going on. And the last example is, um, uh, oh yes, the Lower Thames Crossing. How wonderful, another London one. Um, and again, this is a time series in SAR. Here, this, the, I, I chose this because it's, it, it illustrates what's extraordinary um, about um, our earth observation capabilities. Uh, for SAR data, we have an archive which is nearly 30 years old, uh, 30 years long, in fact, it is 30 years long, it's 2023, yeah. Uh, 30 years uh, in length, just about. Um, and um, for optical data, the archive is 40 years long um, from Landsat. So we have this ability to be able to uh, bench, benchmark them or baseline and look backwards retrospectively. And that's one of the great powers of satellite on Earth observation. So this study, you can see it's 1992 to 2019, it's a long time series, various levels of spatial detail from different SAR data sets. Um, and the, the comparison thereof to just to get a, a, a proper flavor of what the ground is doing uh, in this area in, in East London. So um, the case studies are, are, are superb and well illustrated and come from a variety of different organizations, thanks to all of them for contributing. Um, um, and then that leads me on to how should one use these guidelines? 
Um, so we recognize that you know, there are probably a number of people out there who think, I, I've heard about this technology and I'd really like to get involved, but I don't know how to start. So we wanted to tackle that. Um, and we tried to point the asset bone, uh, the, the, those interested um, to different technologies by asset type. Um, and then we also discussed um, how we should lead people through the process. And anybody who's, who's um, been involved in providing these services across the whole of the team, you know, we, we all agreed about this. You sit down at the beginning of the project um, and you're asking, it's, it's all about the, the questions that the client asks. Um, and those, you know, the, those are the things which dictate what we do, what we recommend. So from, you know, is it a, is it a long-term monitoring project or are you just interested in a snapshot now? Um, what are the scale, how big is this project? Is it, you know, countrywide or is it a very small individual asset? What sort of level of detail do you need? How frequently do you need to monitor hours, weeks, months, years? Um, and then we get to the, the crunch, which is what kind of accuracy, what kind of spatial resolution and accuracy do you need? And you can see at the bottom of this diagram on the right, you know, we trickle down after answering all these questions and it leads you to particular technologies, particular types of data very nicely, actually. Um, and by the time you get to the bottom, you, you know, you and the service provider have got a really good idea of what you need. And then a budget can be made. And that's the important thing is all these discussions have to be made at the point right very early on when you're making your budget. Um, and we want to try and point um, users to, to find the right tool for the right job. We, we, we're not in the business. You won't find any kind of reputable satellite um, service provider that is just wants to sell you anything. We're interested in finding the right thing for you for this job um, and, and providing that. Um, so uh, this kind of how to, how to, to get involved, how to do it, um, and, and how to ask those questions is, is embedded in this set, this particular section as sort a of high level guidance. Um, finally, just uh, we we uh, oh yes we, we also talked about um, an element of that high level guidance is, is like where does each of these technologies fit in the life cycle of an asset? When and uh, I think it was Blanca right at the beginning. So we need to tackle. Um, we need to make it clear that these technologies are applicable at every stage of the assets lifecycle in the pre-planning, in the retrospective analysis, the benchmark, all the way through to um, kind of decommissioning and then ongoing long-term monitoring. Um, and, and so that's an important part of, um, of our vision as we wrote it. So we hope um, that the key things for us um, are that it's like, you know, it's an, it's an easy introduction to the available technology and it allows you to burrow down to the, the detail if you want it, um, you know, how to get in there um, for the more advanced sort of users. Um, but really, I think what we, we want is that, it, uh, is that it gives a flavor of just how mature this technology is, um, because it is, and it has been for some time. Um, and we need to, to get that information out there. Um, it is reliable. And it certainly is accurate. Um, people often ask about the accuracy, and that's been demonstrated time and time again in projects that involve ground in situ instrumentation alongside uh, INSAR, for instance. And you know, it is reliable and it is accurate. And yes, there are caveats, of course there are. Um, but and it's certainly cost effective per square kilometer um, versus the you know the potential impact of not doing something like this in the framework of your of a, of a project monitoring the stability of an asset this is you know this is a, a it's a for, for me it's a what we call a you know a no-brainer it's, it's an important and valuable thing that should be considered right from the beginning um, of course i'm biased but um i try i say that with all um objectivity and, um, and sincerity. So we hope that the guidelines improve the, tr the level of trust um, in, in, um, in, in undertaking or getting involved, embracing this technology and putting, slotting it, getting it in your project um, planning from an early stage in just about every kind of project that you undertake. So that's, that, that's it from me, really. Um, this is a practical instruction and um, what to use, how to use it, which technique, how it can apply, where it can be applied, what are the caveats, what are the limitations, um, and even some very tentative um, ideas on how much it might cost re on a relative scale from one kind of data to, to an, or one kind of product to another. Um, so 
Um, we're very excited about this guide because it's the first time something like this has been written um, for a particular user community, draws together everything that's available. And um, so we hope that it'll be widely read. And we have identified that actually this, is, this document is an important, important place um, within um, a need to um, actually formula, formula uh, formularize, if that's a word, um, regulate maybe or standardize uh, some of the things that we do and, and how we do them um, as a matter of best practice for us into the future. Anyway, so that's all I have to say. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, yes, all your copy now. And uh, I think it's time you know, for us to, to answer some questions now. Yes, brilliant. Thank you, Philippa. A uh, really good overview of the guide and uh, leads neatly on to the next section. So that does bring us to the end of the presentations for the day. Uh, but before we move to the Q&A session, uh, I would just like to issue a quick another quick poll to the audience uh, just to get your initial reaction to the the guidance uh, so let me just launch these real quick okay so how, how useful do you think this guidance will be for your daily work um, and do you have a sense that this guidance document is needed and helpful within your work uh, slash industry I'll just give a couple of seconds to go through that. Good to see there's on my end, there's no no's yet. So that's <laughs> that's a really good answer. Okay, seems to have settled now. Um, so most said very useful, useful, and everyone that answered said that it will. Uh, is that this guidance is needed and helpful within their industry. So really, really good, good pitch, Philippa. <laughs> okay, so now on to the Q&A session. Uh, like I said before, if you do have any questions, please put them in the uh, Q&A box now. We do have a few that, to go through uh, and I, I have a few questions of my own and I'm sure some of the other panelists do as well. So if I could just quickly invite all of these speakers to put their cameras on and unmute, and we will go through some of the questions. Ian, I know we've agreed to sort of chair this uh, jointly, um, and, and we do just have sort of 10 minutes to go through some of the questions. So would you like to kick off with one of the uh, Q&A questions? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first question was from uh, Francis McEwen. Uh, he was saying one of the satellite imagery uh, considered was to look at potential scour risks for bridges and uh, the accuracy and the lack of any estimate of costs, even ballpark, left it difficult to justify pursuing. So is there any thoughts on that from, from, from the panel then? So somebody trying to use satellite imagery to look at potential scale risk for bridges, We're struggling with accuracy and the lack of yeah. estimated costs. I'm not surprised. Anything down the side of a bridge is difficult for um, satellite. Um, that's, uh, and, and it's, if anybody's got anything particular to say to that, I think that's that's a pretty challenging target. Um, uh, is it at the water level? You know, below the water level? Uh, yeah, fair, that's going to be hard. Um, possibly a case for a drone. <clears throat> Anybody else like to say anything about that? I think, Francis, that's a, that's a, a tough one. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, Philippa. Um, the sorts of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the issue that we had with the very, very steep slopes at the, yeah. on the A66, which created shadowing for yeah. a, a, Collusion a, is a problem. Yeah. facing satellite, and you're going to have similar problems on the, yeah. on any structure. Um, yes. I, I am thinking you're going you know you're going to you're going to if you're using insight you're, you're going to get points on the bridge um and on the bank if it's not too vegetated yeah. but depending on the orientation of the bridge and where those footings and the scours are you, yeah you, you could be occluded and um i think um a more close range technique um mm would be a better way i think yeah i think something like lidar would probably be yeah. better oh yeah absolutely 
Yeah. 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 Hmm. All right. So uh, on, on to the next question. I suppose this is a more and more uh, technical one uh, from uh, Christopher Power said, uh, I can understand the cost per square kilometre weighing up for a region scale problem, but wonder how it looks for an owner of a long, thin linear asset. Uh, so for a transportation network, for example, uh, just would be interested in the panel's views on that. Nuria? Uh, yes, uh, here, just me, just let me think a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, well, there are many examples of uh, linear assets, for instance, they just to uh, here in UK, you know, that they are using Earth observation, especially in SAR for the, the design and the, the construction phases and also planning already the post-construction. So, well, about the cost per square kilometers, uh, well, first of all, we need to differentiate yeah, the, the optical images, for instance, and the SAR images that are not uh, cell for square kilometers, but uh, the, the full image acquired, which is the price is different for different providers, they can even be free. But then, of course, there is the, the cost is difficult to estimate uh, generally because it depends on the provider, it depends on the images used. So, yeah. Mm, so, uh, about this, the, my recommendation is uh, well, just to speak with mm, the provider or different provider and ask a proposal for, for the the linear asset in, in question, no? but there are very interesting examples of these uh, mm -hmm. linear assets mm -hmm. done with, yeah, as observation. Yes, I should have said actually that the, the, the case studies cover all different kinds of assets, railways, roads, uh, bridges, tunnels, um, you know, um, geomorphology, lands, landslides, and, and urban areas, they, they cover all sorts of things. So mm -hmm. the, if you want to know about um, practical examples for linear assets there's there's a lot of them in, in mm -hmm. the guidelines mm -hmm. it's probably worth adding that, that the costs of star imagery depend on whether you need to actually commission a satellite it might be that, a, that an image is already available so, so national highways have been engaged with a uh l band l band yeah l band satellite provider um and they were initially very worried about the cost but because they've been commissioned to take an image already, it's available to them at, at a low cost. Um, now the costs of uh, C-band in SAR and L-band SAR are, are very different as well. You know, a lot, a lot, some of the in SAR stuff will rely on Sentinel-1, which the data is freely available, or, or you know, others will rely on commercial satellites, which, which vary much more. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, in, that's an important point, actually. So um, depending on the on the SAR data used, and, and as James said, it's, there are some data sets which are globally um, and routinely collected every few days, um, like Sentinels, um, and they are free to use um, the raw data. But the commercial stuff, the higher is anything high resolution in Earth observation always has a cost attached to it. That's where the commercial uh, interest is, the commercial edge. Um, so, so for instruments like Terrasar X, the, these are much higher resolution and much more applicable to, to you know, detailed um, structures on the ground, urban areas. They have a cost, but importantly, they're not routinely collected. So as James says, they, there might be data already collected for an asset, but there might not. So that would have to be tasked. So there is a cost to the data. But these, you know, these, these scenes of satellites, they are kind of tens of kilometers across, 60 kilometers across, or, or maybe a bit less for a high resolution one. So it's, you actually get a lot of data for your money. And yes, you might need hundreds of images over a, a time period. But, um, and that, that cost racks up, of course it does, but it's, Compared to the cost of a borehole, it, it, it's it's still a small cost. And then when you when that boy, even when you put the processing time in, which is not inconsiderate for for Insar, um, per square kilometre, that's it's still a fraction, um, a very small fraction of your budget. I would think in many cases, not all, I'm sure. Thanks. Um, there's a question from Stephen Diebel. 
saying the title is Insar and Earth Observations. Are these different techniques? I was, I was going to add something to, onto that. I, I was going to ask myself, really, can you explain perhaps why Insar got singled out as, as the technique mentioned in the title? Who'd like to answer yeah. this? Go on, Nuri. Ah, yes. Okay. Well, uh, Insar uh, is uh, into the Earth observation techniques, of course, but this guide uh, had a special focus in Insar. Uh, so, so that's why uh, the title. Well, we wanted to emphasize Earth observation in general, and especially Insar. Isn't it, uh, Philippa? Do you want? Yeah, to yeah, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, that's right. Yeah, we we, we discussed this a great length. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Earth observation covers all of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the the extra focus is because Insar's because of Insar's capability to deliver millimeter scale precision. Mm -hmm. Like you can't. You, you, you can't get that any other way. And that is something which is really pertinent to you guys, your, you know, to managing the state of assets, what's moving, what's not moving. That we felt that that was really important. There was a discussion that we should just make the guidelines on insult. And that, you know, that had a that had some merit, but um, we decided to keep it broad as well. Thank you, Philippa. Um, I suppose this is more of a clarification one. Are there any case study examples for the use of EO and flood defense structures? So for example, walls and embankments. And I see uh, one of our steering group members, Ren Capes, has, has provided some insight into uh, the Netherlands Dyke Network is, is routinely inside monitored. So thanks for that, Ren. But um, Philip Erdnuria, anyone? Um, I'm nothing particular to add about that. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the orientation of the structure always. But yes, um, uh, we're looking at, at coastal um, monitoring with INSAR um, and seeing all kinds of fascinating things. Um, but yeah, depending on the orientation mm -hmm. of the coast, you can see one or other mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah, there's a question, it was more for Philippa, I think. There's uh, about the decision-making flowchart that you came up. Oh yeah. And I was saying there are several routes that can be taken through the early questions, but they all seem to end up back at what level of precision or accuracy is required. Yes. Um, so presumably some of those questions have an influence in technology chosen. Is it, well, uh, is this yeah, how okay. is it, the guide is meant to be used is the end of that question? But because that is a key question, right? It's the, the resolution, the detail, the accuracy. That is a key question. But there are, there are many ways to sort of, you know, like they... they there are many technologies that provide high resolution and low resolution, and um, resolution isn't the only question, but you, it has to go in, it goes into the mix. And so the flow leads you one way or another. So if you, if you, if you want long-term monitoring and you want millimeter scale precision, and you want um, in, um, uh, image, data every few days, you know, that's going to take you all the way to time or where, whichever side it is, time series insight, because there's nothing else that can give you all of those things together. But you still have to answer those early questions. The, 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 that flow diagram isn't intended to, um, to give the impression that the early questions somehow get are forgotten or that they, they all lead in the same direction. You might answer those questions and find that something else is, is needed. Like if, if you need imagery every, or data every hour, then there's no satellite imagery or technology that can do that. You have to go then, if you're, you know, you're going to need drone or air or airborne or whatever, some other technology. And okay, that, that isn't represented on the diagram. There isn't a di an arrow that leads you off to the side, but it's meant to, to capture the kind of conversations that you have with a client right at the beginning. We've all been there. Um, uh, that you, you have to answer those questions first in order to figure out if, if and what is the appropriate technology and you always end up with a, a discussion at some point about the precision and the accuracy mm -hmm. thank you um i think now is a good time to wrap up the q a session just in the interest of time ah. um so thanks to the panel for your for your answers and any questions that are we did not have time to cover uh, we will endeavour to follow those up after the webinar. So just to summarise a few of the key messages from the day, uh, Ian McKenzie provided us with some context on the uh, INSAR and Earth observation scene from a government perspective um, on infrastructure asset management. James 
Cod then proceeded to give us insight into an interesting collaboration between National Highways, Arup and ACOM using INSAR to showcase how clients, consultancies and contractors can, can really work together in this space. And Philippa then gave us a, a solid overview of new Syria guidance, demonstrating its place in industry and how it addresses some of the key challenges as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to once again thank the project funders and steering group, uh, as well as the author team who have worked very long and hard on this together to bring us this incredibly useful guidance document. Uh, thanks to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, Ian, James, Philippa and Nuria, thank you for your valuable contributions today. Uh, we will circulate a link to speakers presentations uh, after the webinar. And like I said, we'll endeavour to answer any questions not covered today. And if you think of anything else that you want to send to our speakers, please let us know. Uh, we are keen to hear about your experience today and would be grateful if you could complete the uh, online survey, which will be emailed to you shortly. So just really quickly on how to actually purchase a copy of the guide for yourself. If you head over to Syria's online bookshop, which is uh, www.syria.org forward slash bookshop, you should be able to see the guidance available for purchase with reference of C805. Uh, we have a preferential offer for all of those who have attended today's webinar for £55 for Syria members and £110 for non-members, uh, but this runs until the 3rd of March and it reverts back to the original price. So simply complete and return the publication digest form that was circulated with the webinar joining instructions. And uh, we will circulate this form again in the post event email shortly along with the survey. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time today and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. So goodbye everyone.